you know, we're in this series uh, from, from Colossians um, where, where we're kind of looking at that word necessary. There are many things that we talk about, and sometimes I fear we read the Scriptures, uh, and not the least when Paul speaks, uh, sometimes, you know, that these are good things, they're helpful things, they're useful things, and we kind of add some of that to our lives. Oh, that's a good idea, or that's a good thought, and, you know, we kind of work that out. But when Paul speaks, he never speaks just to say something that is good or helpful, like we're taking an aspirin or an Advil if we have a headache. He's talking about something that is necessary. If you want to know the power of God, we better listen up because this is not just good or even good advice. This is necessary, a word from God. And today we want to talk about necessary transformation you know when paul wrote to the colossian church he wrote to a church that had been started as i mentioned before by one of his co-workers but it was a church in in a kind of a, a very busy city a lot of kind of crossways of the world went through there and and so also a lot of ideas kind of crept into the church that were just church ideas from the world around them and people thought well becoming a christian allow me to know god you know, without having to give up all of that because these other things are important as well. And Paul says, no, 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 no. In Christ, the whole fullness of God is found. You need nothing extra. Everything is found in Christ. And, you know, fullness matters. And, and you know, there are different ways of talking about this. And I want to just begin by saying, as you find your way to to Colossians chapter 2. It'll be on the screen in just a moment. You know, we can use that term full in negative ways, right? If I'm saying you're so full of it, <laughs> it almost doesn't matter what the it is, right? It's just not a good thing, right? And oftentimes when we say you're full of it, we're thinking about you're full of yourself. It doesn't matter what we're talking about. You're going to find some way of bringing yourself into that, right? That, that's what that is. But but fullness can also be a good thing, and it's a positive experience. We, we talk to someone, and you look at them, and you say, you're so full of joy. That's a good thing, right? Or you're so full of, you say, it, understanding, of insight, of knowledge, of, you know, whatever you, you may kind of put in that word, that is a good thing. It can even be when we talk about difficult things, right? And, and right now, I say, I am so filled with grief. That's not necessarily a positive thing, but it, it helps us understand it, and it's a good way of saying it. And I was just at a conference I mentioned, uh, you know, a week and a half ago or whatever, uh, that was so rich. And I heard several people after that, they just said, I'm just so full right now. And you see, what happens when you get filled like that, what you're full of kind of transforms your life. That's why for Christians, it's so important to be filled, as Paul talks about, with the Spirit, because what you're full of will transform your life. Jesus speaks about it the same way sometimes. He just uses a phraseology that whatever your heart is full of, your mouth will speak. Because you can't help it, right? You, you know that. We Intuitively, we know what it means to be full of something. If you have just had an experience that truly impacted your life, what do you got to do? You got to tell everybody about it. You can't help it. You just got to do that. If you saw a movie that you thought was extraordinary, you, you got to tell someone about it. it. It's just how it works. Now, Paul speaks. Now, in Colossians chapter 2, and I'm going to overlap with one verse that we ended with last Sunday and begin again in verse 8 of chapter 2 to the Colossians because he kind of compares and contrasts this. He says here, Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deceit based on human tradition, based on the elements of the world rather than on Christ. Four. The entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ, and you have been filled with him who is the head over every ruler and authority. You were also circumcised in him with the circumcision 
not done with hands by putting off the body of flesh in the circumcision of Christ when you are buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. And when you are dead in trespasses and in the, the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive with him uh, and forgave us all our trespasses. He erased the certific certificate of debt with his obligations that was against us and opposed us, and he has taken it away by nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and the authorities, disgraced them publicly. He triumphed over them in him. You know, this whole language of filling is an interesting kind of language, right? When in more technical jargon, uh, it's called liquid language. Because it kind of speaks to us about, you know, filling it. You're thinking, either way, you think about a gas tank in, in a car or a bottle, and you're, you're filling it up, and it can be, it's not either full or, or empty. It is always more or less. It's not either or. And you, you kind of use that language a lot about these things. You know, you, if you're kind of completely exhausted, you can be running on what? Empty. We, we have this liquid language so often expressed in, in so many things. I can be completely drained, or I can be filled, or, or all these kinds of things that, that gives us a sense that, that a life is not just either or, but more or less. And that is true, friends, also in your work, on your walk with God. And that's why I was so excited to hear about uh, about the, this camp and, and the youth and their desire not just to be kind of full, not just to be not empty, but to be filled with the Spirit, truly changed by God. And what he's doing here, Paul, of course, he's making this contrast between verse 8 when he said, be careful that you're not taken captive by what sounds like great ideas, but here's the contrast. Be filled by God. Because he has the power over every rule. In some ways, if, if you want to uh, take it directly to an illustration that we may all get, what, what the Paul is talking about here is the reality of Christ alone. And by that, if you want to have a modern example of that, you know, you look at labels nowadays, right, because you want to know what is in the food that you eat or the drinks that you're drinking. If you can't pronounce it, spell it, you probably shouldn't eat it, right? That's kind of what it is. And so you have the normal, the good stuff that could have built you up and they fill it up with junk that destroys you. We even have something now that they're called GMO, genetically modified organisms. Right, so that they can change the very nature of what things are. Paul says, don't do that with the gospel. You're not going to know the power of Christ that way. What you're going to see is you're going to see that, that you're going to find people who are Christians when they do that, their life as Christians are not going to make that much difference. Even their faith is not going to make that much difference in their lives. So how does that work? He's using some very intriguing kind of language here when he's speaking about this. He's, he jumps straight from that to the question and the, the language of circumcision. You have been circumcised, not, not physically, that's not the point, not by hands, in other words, but spiritually and like just like the old testament is talking about in deuteronomy where god says that i will circumcise your heart and not only yours but your descendants that you will love me fully with your heart with your soul and with your mind that is all of you and everything about you will come to love me it is a true circumcision now we know that the externals can kind of 
take over and just become the form. And that's what had happened, of course, in Jewish life. And we're going to move that a little bit to baptism also later on since Paul is talking about that, where it can just be external form. The, the circumcision was this sign that they had on their body that they belonged to the people that belonged to God. But when you take away the real significance of that, the only thing you have left is the form, the external, what doesn't matter. And, and of course, the Old Testament speaks against that. The New Testament warns against it directly about the danger of, of that. The importance is always the reality. And, you know, if you remember when Paul uh, writes to the church in, in the Corinth, He's talking about already in chapter 1, he just said hello, and then he says, I hear that among you there's, there's factions. Some of you want to follow Apollo. Some of you want to follow Caesar. Some of you want to follow Paul. What? Was Paul crucified for you? Was Paul, were you baptized in the name of Paul? No. You're crucified. Christ was crucified for you, baptized in the name of of Christ. So don't pollute it with other ideas and, and kind of pull over into other things. There is a physical, literal kind of expression of that, and that's not unimportant. It's a sign that reminds us, but it is void if the real reality is not there. And that's really what he's talking about uh, when he's talking about this here, right? Just like, like the Circumcision hovers over the Jewish people as the major sign that is there of a covenant that is made with God. So baptism hovers over the Christian church as a sign of the covenant that is made with God. Now, of course, that covenant, and if it's just the external signs, it becomes empty, and I'll talk about that in just a little bit. But please hear me when we hear this. A covenant language means that you have connected with someone in a real, genuine relationship to, that transforms who you are. The way you think about yourself, the way you think about your neighbors, the way you think about the world, the way you think about purpose, all of that is transformed. And it is necessarily so. So what about baptism? We just saw one this morning. We saw several last Sunday. We've seen quite a few, and, and God is gracious with that. Now, we say, as they are baptized, buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in the newness of life, that is a complete, utter transformation. Now, it could just be an outer ritual that has no meaning. It's just what we do. No. Paul says, no, 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 that kind of language is not just flippant language. This is real. And you're buried with Christ. That is, you're immersed. That word means that you're immersed. That is, you're, it, everything is gone. And then you're raised to walk in the newness of life. Think about this. I don't know if you ever thought about this. But when Christ stepped out of that grave on resurrection morning, all that kind of burial cloth was left in the grave. He didn't bring that back out, right? Everything was left behind, and he came out, resurrected. And that is what happens with the transformation that Christ is doing. And the baptism, of course, is the symbol of that. It's the expression of that. It's not an unimportant thing, just like a marriage, right? A marriage is important, but the ceremony doesn't change everything. Not that it's not important, hear me right, but that's not it. The marriage is actually lived after that, yes? You can have the externals, you can have two people even get married that doesn't even love each other, for that matter, that doesn't even know each other. What happened with that? Nothing. Now, they get technically married, but there's no real marriage. The same is true if you have really messed up and you've got to figure out a way and, and you want to not express love because you don't care about that. You just bring flowers because that's what you do. 
I want you to hear what I'm saying here, that you can be just all external. But the external is not unimportant, but they need to be an expression of what is actually, truly going on. You know, there's something here, right? When, when we talk about the true meaning of baptism, right, which has to do with this covenant relationship that is somewhat expressed also in the circumcision uh, as that is looked for in, in the old covenant. That is an identity marker. When you have a covenant with someone, that is the truth here, right? So you're covenanted with God. That is, you're identified with him. That is in his death. That is in his pain. That is in his sorrow. That is in his difficulties. There's nothing that is not coming your way if you are part of who he is. But also, in his resurrection. The power to overcome, that is the strength that he's doing again and again in this text, that it's not just that you are buried with him and raised, but you also see in that cross the power to overrule and overcome every authority, every ruler, every single bad influence. This is important when you see this here. It is about trust in God, and I promise you, that is difficult. We could talk about it. You've heard it before. I'm probably not saying anything you've not heard several times before, but it is, it is like my dad used to say, you know, if, if there's a rock, sometimes you need to spit on it a lot before it gets wet. You get that? It may not get wet by the first, but you keep doing it, it'll get wet. Sometimes we need repetition, right? That's what he was trying to say with that kind of strange illustration right there but but think about this here Soren Kierkegaard some of you know Soren Kierkegaard one of the great philosophers of history a Danish philosopher in the early 1800s he died 1855 most people who have studied a little bit of that would have heard his name at least right he has this great great illustration and he's talking about this man who is kind of coming running uh, and there's a huge fire behind him, and he's trying to outrun the fire. Suddenly, there's a cliff, and he can't run any further. All he sees is an abyss and darkness, and he feels the, the heat is coming closer behind him, and, and he, suddenly he hears a voice from down there, jump! And he says, I can't jump, I can't see you. And the one down there calls back up, but I can see you just jump. Faith is like that, friends. Trust God. Even when you can't see him, he will see you. All of this that we're talking about here happened through the power of God. Transformation. We baptize on the basis of the confession of faith that I will trust. God, that is, make him my Lord and Savior. So this identification with Christ becomes so extraordinarily important. In the ancient world, identification sometimes had to do with just big images. So you, you live in a certain area of the world, and, and many were slaves, and they were building a pyramid, so they were doing whatever they were doing, and you had a huge picture of the emperor that they had never seen, but they knew that they were working under him, so to speak. Some of that imagery might have been there when, when they were speaking, but really when we hear that, we hear that there's someone who is looking after us, who can see us when we don't see him. Necessary transformation. Why is it necessary? Because it sets us free, friends. We like to talk about ourselves as we are Americans. We live in the land of the free. Can I say that straight up? No such thing exists. The Son will set you free. Yes? Jesus Christ will set you free. The real freedom may, or will only come as he sets you free. Now, we may feel freedom, we may feel some things are free, but let me give you four easy hints 
on what makes people truly free, and they're all theological. They will all come back to Christ, really. People who are free are people who have uh, got, come to grips with their past. People who have been able to, with the power of Christ, to treat all their pain, to treat their difficulty, whatever has happened to them in their past, they have been able to move beyond that by the power of Christ and see that not as the guiding directory from their future, but just memories from the past. And now Christ has given them freedom to move forward. The second one, people that are free have experienced true forgiveness that they know that they have been forgiven. They know that even their own condemnation of themselves, that in Christ there is no condemnation. They're set free from their own even inability to, to forgive themselves. Three, people who are truly free are not burdened by the power of habit. And hear me what I say here, the habit can be good, there can be really good habit, but you're not, you're not determined by that in the sense that they don't, have habits, when habits have power over you that you can't choose them, they're bad. So what are bad habits? They are addictions, they are dependencies, they are the things people who are free have overcome those kinds of things. You don't do that on your own, you do that in the power of Jesus. Are we hearing what? What I'm saying here, I think that's what Paul says, and that is what Scripture says when those who are free are free in Christ, and they're free indeed. The last thing I would say here, that people who are free are not burdened by the opinion and the criticism of other people. And and by that I mean that we are not simply living for that. We are set free to go and walk the path that Christ has given us to walk other people may have their opinion other people may do that but we follow what we are learning from christ here if these four things are reality in your life you are free indeed i need to look look further into this text and just notice what paul is doing here this is so transformative and I mean that. I really hope you're not hearing me just saying in other sermons, just speaking out because i got to say something. It's Sunday morning. Are you hearing me here? If we don't hear the word of Christ, if we don't sense the power of the need and the necessity of being set free, truly transformed by the Spirit, we will just be a group that gathers. We enjoy the same things broadly in, in certain areas. If Christ is going to use us to transform not only our own lives and our own family, which he would do and he begins there, and then our neighborhoods, and then our city, and then our, our state, and then our nation, and then our world, it comes when people are truly transformed. What you're full of will truly transform you. Are we hearing this? Here's what I have thought about many times when I've been on my knees. I said, Lord, if I had been one of the 12, or even worse, if all the 12 had been like me, would the gospel have died out in that first generation? That's the real question, folks, right? We are asking ourselves that how can we be transformed by Christ? There is simply a need for us, and it may not be true of first Alan, but then of all of the Christians, let me put it that way, for us to be impacted by the dynamic power of the cross, that we see what is said here and the power that the cross is given or is giving us every day. Paul was riding into a situation where they had been saved. They had come to this point where they have come to know Christ. It was a city, of course. Remember, there was no Christianity 
as such. If a phrase had come up there, he started a church, there's a group of Christian, and then other ideas were coming in, and the gospel was being diluted, and, and suddenly there was no real effect. It's a lot of what Paul says in this, that therefore becomes not just some, try to change these things, let's just tweak it a bit. He says, no, 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 no. You need to be truly transformed and recognize that anything and everything you ever need is found in Christ. It's a power to transform. And so when you look at, look at some of these things, like can, I, can, I, uh, can I give another illustration by Soren Kierkegaard, uh, that philosopher that, that uh, has so many great things to say. I'm going to read it for you. Is that okay? So I won't mess it up and make it too long. It's a great little thing. Here's what he says. There's a little town of ducks. Every Sunday, the ducks waddle out of their houses and waddle down Main Street to their church. They waddle into the sanctuary and squat in their proper pews. The duck choir waddles in and takes its place. Then the duck minister comes forward and opens the duck Bible. He reads to them, Ducks, God has given you wings. With wings you can fly. With wings you can mount up and soar like eagles. No walls can confine you. No fences can hold you. You have wings. God has given you wings. You can fly like birds. And all the ducks shouted, Amen! And as the worship service came to the end, they all waddled home. <laughs> it's tough sometimes, isn't it? To kind of feel and see the actual power. We agree, but the actual power of the gospel to allow Christ to do his work that is genuinely transformative can be difficult so paul is trying to give us all kinds of great things here just with a potpourri if you will almost like a festive fireworks of great imagery and illustration at the end if you go to verse 13 you'll see here the first it says that we were dead in our trespasses the imagery here of course is that that if you become so used to things that you're not even paying attention anymore you know, someone who is dead to something can't do anything about it. They stop struggling to change anything. That's just who they are. And then he moves on, and, and he says, right, and, and although you were dead in your trespasses, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he forgave us. How? He erased the certificate of debt with all his ab obligations against us. That imagery is so powerful. If you think about it just for a half a moment, so, so there's a, this certificate of debt like that, that you owe all these things and it's weighing you down and how will you get beyond that and how can you do anything about it? And the imagery here is even stronger than what we can think. What we can think is someone is just coming to line it out just to kind of erase it with, with just scratching it out. But the imagery here is that because in the ancient world you wrote in papyri and the ink didn't have any acid so you could lift it up are you hearing me so you didn't even see it you could take the ink off the papyri so you couldn't see that it's been there it's not that it was erased and you could still kind of see it it was gone that's what he has promised us yes are you hearing this whatever your past may be whatever your reality may be he has forgiven you, and he want to lift that burden off, and it needs to dis disappear. Now, how does that happen? He nailed it to the cross. That's it. The power of the cross. Don't act as if Golgotha never happened. The cross of Calvary took care of your sins. Not just kind of wipe them out, 
but lifted it off the certificate of debt. This is so important that, that we see this because life is truly changed. That's also why he's not just kind of making this imagery stay with that, that it's just about getting, you know, forgiveness for your guilt or for what you owe. He's saying, oh, no, 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 this is a power. It is a power to overcome all the rulers, all the authorities, all the things that come against you. Say, well, I feel like I have to do this. I don't know how to not do this because everybody else is going to think I'm crazy if I don't go, go there. And he said, no, 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 in Christ, everything changed. And to the point where he can disarm the rulers. You will find victory in Christ, not there. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but that's what you're going to see come out of this. This on rulers and authority and publicly disgrace them. That is, it's going to be clear at one time that the life with Christ is transformative and will change everything. Your personal life, your fight with all the stuff that has gone on, your memories, your pain, your scars, all of that, your marriage, your home, your friends, your workmates. Christ has that power. Transformation, friends, is not an add-on. Don't try to take Christianity, turn it into some kind of GMO, right? So I have my life, I'll just add some Christian stuff to it and just do a little bit of modification. Let him have his power. Father, I ask. And I stand here with everyone here and those who are listening even. And we beg you, Lord, to do a work in our lives. We ask forgiveness. When we just took you for granted and didn't see the need for genuine transformation. Lord, would you do a work here? Everyone who is in earshot and eyeshot of this place right now. Work in us, Lord. Change us. Amen.